had a very distinguished career in, uh, in the Indian Foreign Service. Uh, 1982, 82 service, uh, served in, uh, in Islamabad, uh, uh, London, Timpu, and Kuwait. Uh, in New Delhi, he was uh, also in the Ministry, uh, apart from the, the Ministry of External Affairs, he was in the Ministries of Finance and Commerce. A graduate of uh, Delhi University, he has a PhD in modern history from the JNU. This afternoon, he will re give, uh, give us some reflections on uh, India's looking at the East, looking eastwards in terms of India's foreign policy. Uh, but hopefully, the discussions will, I'm sure, will, will focus uh, or, or slightly wider than that because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, as, as India is perhaps far too important to uh, just look at uh, one direction. Uh, why so? Uh, well, India is the world's second most populous country and also has the fastest economic growth uh, rates in the world. It is a nuclear power and uh, has the 10th largest military expenditure, one of the largest conventional, non uh, conventional war fighting capability. It is said to be the ninth largest economy by nominal uh, uh, rates and fourth largest by purchasing power capacity, parity. It sits in the UN Security Council, and as of uh, January, uh, it will uh, represent uh, uh, South Asia along with Pakistan, <coughs> and seeks a permanent uh, seat there. Its burgeoning uh, influence on the matrix of uh, uh, rising Asia gives it a prominent place in, uh, in uh, international affairs, as well as a place in the high table of global issues. During the Cold War, uh, uh, Nehru had once said that uh, uh, the only uh, alternative to coexistence is co-destruction. So has Indian foreign policy thinking evolved since then? And if so, how? Uh, this rising India, as we uh, say, has many friends. But there are also those who are wary. And uh, Thucydides had uh, taught us long ago that uh, when Athens grows strong, there is fear in Sparta. So uh, we shall hear Dr. Raghavan speak to these and other issues. And hopefully thereafter, we will have a stimulating, as we have it, had in the past of these sessions, stimulating discussion on these and other issues. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chaudhary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I greatly look forward to this afternoon. Uh, I'm, I will begin with a confession. Uh, Professor Chaudhary gave me a great deal of latitude in choosing the subject of my talk today. And uh, when I sent the summary out, I must confess I was a little enthusiastic. So I will seek your indulgence in a little more latitude in interpreting what I have to speak on uh, today. Uh, it is difficult to be original on India and its foreign policy in an institution which has a formidable reputation for the study of India and South Asia. I realize also the pitfalls of going into details of specific issues in a room full of specialists. On the other hand, I do wish to avoid inflicting, a you, or inflicting on you a series of platitudes and truisms with regard to Indian foreign policy. And I'm therefore cognizant of the risk of too general a presentation. I will therefore sketch out very briefly a selective overview of what I perceive as being India's worldview at the end of 2011. I believe an overview is important, even for a specialist audience such as this. The static from India's democracy is loud. It extends far beyond <coughs> India. Sometimes it appears to me in Singapore that it is as loud here as it is anywhere else. This has obviously to do with a range of issues and factors, not least because of the centers of intellectual excellence in Singapore, such as the Institute of South Asian Studies. But the end result is often 
a far greater emphasis and attention to what is believed to be not happening or what should be happening rather than looking at what is happening and why is it uh, happening. Uh, it is in this spirit that I sketch out what I see as the important recent developments in India's perspective with respect to South Asia, Southeast Asia, and before turning to some thematic issues such as those arising from our membership of the UN Security Council, as also ongoing multilateral issues such as those pertaining to climate uh, change. My effort is to look at relatively recent developments, those which would be fresh in our memory, and the idea really is to cull from these certain broad principles and thrusts so as to contextualize India's views of emerging trends. The methodology I adopt, and this is largely for reasons of convenience, is to look sequentially at high-level visits. Firstly, this animates the somewhat abstract world of foreign policy, but also because, as you are all aware, high-level visits are an entry into understanding national priorities. And especially when there are clusters of visits, it is possible to decipher from these trusts, on, trusts in policy. Uh, for la reasons largely to keep the scope of the discussion compact, I do not have much to say about Africa, about Europe, or indeed about other critical relationships of India, such as Russia, or those with Central Asia, or with regard to China per se. But let me begin very briefly with uh, South Asia. Our Prime Minister visited Bangladesh in September 2011. President Karzai uh, from Afghanistan visited India in October 2011. Our, pri our Prime Minister thereafter visited Mali in November, both for a bilateral visit as also for the SARC uh, summit. The Prime Minister of Nepal, Mr. Baburam Tarai, was in India again in October 2011. And there have been head of state, head of government level, head of state level visits from Bhutan as also high-level exchanges with Sri Lanka and Pakistan, uh, including those at higher government level at the margins of international conferences. We have had in brief over the past few months a period of intense engagement within South Asia. I do not wish to go into the details of each of these important engagements, but will very briefly touch on a few of them. An important outcome with regard to the Bangladesh visit was the conclusion of a protocol to the 1974 Land Boundary Agreement. It is noteworthy that the Chief Ministers of Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Tripura had accompanied the Prime Minister during his visit to Bangladesh. It is also well known that the Chief Minister of West Bengal did not, uh, did not do so. However, the important point is that while both sides agreed that more time was needed to reach an arrangement that was fair and equally acceptable with regard to the sharing of Tista waters, it was also agreed that both sides would continue working towards concluding this agreement at the earliest. The point here is that the area of convergence between India and Bangladesh has expanded, and this underscores the marked change in the bilateral relationship in the recent past. It is therefore useful to recall in this context that our former Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, had been conferred Bangladesh's highest award posthumously in July 2011. I would also mention with respect to the visit of the Prime Minister of Nepal that an important outcome of this visit was the revival of the Foreign Minister Level Joint Commission, which incidentally had not met since 1992. President Karzai's visit is in fact part of a series of continued high-level consultations between India and Afghanistan. This was his second visit in 2011, and our Prime Minister had himself visited Kabul in May 2011, when he was given the unique honor of addressing a joint session of the Afghan parliament. The highlight of the current visit was, of course, the agreement on strategic partnership. In many ways, this agreement does no more than formalize what had already existed between, no more than formalize what had already existed between the two countries. But what has perhaps been given great significance is the fact that India is the first country to sign such an agreement with Afghanistan. An overview of South Asia would thus certainly suggest a situation which appears positive and forward-looking. There are specific reasons for this with respect to each of the countries in South Asia. 
However, if one steps back from the country specific or from the contingent, it is also possible to see a longer term and subcontinent wide dynamic operating. And we see its results over the full length of South Asia from Maldives to Afghanistan. In part, this dynamic is economic and in particular relates to the prospects for other South Asian economies as they interface with the Indian economy. The political landscape is in brief being pushed in a particular direction of greater societal and economic interaction between India and each of its South Asian neighbors. It is also fair to say perhaps that technology, <coughs> travel, and the explosion in the capacity for individuals to communicate directly across borders is continuously raising the benchmark for what constitutes good relations between neighboring countries in South Asia. Regardless of this lineup of objective forces, it is by no means inevitable that change will always be linear. With respect to Pakistan, for instance, it has often been said that relations with India are accident prone and our Prime Minister had spoken of the possible risks to the bilateral relationship if evidence were to emerge of Pakistan government agencies being involved in acts of terrorism. Security-related cooperation is in fact a very critical part of the bilateral spectrum with all our neighbours. Our expectation at the minimum is that our neighbours not allow their territories to be used for activity against India. There is perhaps growing and greater recognition of this principle that the potential for bilateral relations will only be reaped if this aspect remains central. For the sake of completeness, I should mention that these, in, that these internal positive signs in South Asia are in contrast to the volatile situations developing in our north and northwest, and in particular in Pakistan and Iran. Such a situation, so proximate to us, is hardly comfortable. And a negative, negative, a negative development in Iran will have very adverse implications for Afghanistan, of course, but also for the whole of South Asia. With this overview, let me turn to Southeast Asia. It seems reasonable to posit a consolidation of our Look East policy in the run-up to the commemorative summit next year in India to mark 20 years of our dialogue partnership with ASEAN. Certainly, our Prime Minister's visit to Singapore is to be seen in the broader context of this consolidation of the Look East policy. To some extent, this is also illustrated by the frequency of high-level visits. Our President had visited Cambodia and Laos in September 2010. Our Prime Minister then visited, had visited Thailand in October 2009. Malaysia and Vietnam in October 2010. Incoming visits include the Indonesian President in January 2011, the Thai Prime Minister in April 2011, the New Zealand Prime Minister in June 2011, and the President of Vietnam in October 2011. In the same month, the President of Myanmar, Thian Sien, had visited India, accompanied by a very high-level delegation comprising the Joint, Chiefs, the Joint Chief of Defense Staff and 12 ministers. This visit saw the unveiling of a substantive bilateral agenda, and in particular, an underscoring of the role Myanmar plays as the gateway between Southeast and South Asia. These high-level exchanges also have to be seen in the context of the fact that in 2012, as I mentioned, we will be observing 20 years of the dialogue partnership with ASEAN with a commemorative summit in India. Both the Vietnam and Myanmar visits attracted a great deal of attention and analysis. To some extent, this is for the wrong reason, because India-Myanmar or India-Vietnam relations are seen as being of significance only as a subset of China's rise or China's position in Southeast and East Asia. In fact, a similar analytical perspective prevails with regard to Afghanistan, in which the India-Afghanistan interface is seen exclusively through the so-called AFPAC paradigm. This is fundamentally a flawed approach. It is in fact a kind of reverse orientalism of the kind which had dominated 19th and 20th century discourse about Asia. It should be noted that India's relations with both Myanmar and Vietnam, or indeed with Afghanistan, have had an independent dynamic over the past half century. And not to give due weight to that dynamic will lead to an imperfect understanding 
of the situation. Our bilateral relationship with Singapore is valuable and important in itself. Bilateral trade turnover in 2010-11 was of the order of US dollars, 17.5 billion, and this excludes Singapore's re-exports to India. Singapore's FDI in India to the beginning of this year was US dollars 14 billion. Indian FDI in Singapore is even larger, and by end of 2010-11 was US dollars 23 billion. Singapore is an important center for our private companies to base themselves for carrying out business transactions and investments in other parts of East Asia and ASEAN. In the region, Singapore is a major overseas investor in Vietnam, China, Indonesia, as indeed in India. It is in our interest to attract an even greater quantum of Singapore investments into our infrastructure sector, and this would further, in our belief, catalyze investments from other countries. Our expectation is that with the Prime Minister's visit to Singapore and the anticipated return visit of the Singapore Prime Minister to India, this aspect will get an even sharper focus. <coughs> Our close political relationship with Singapore is underpinned also by a good strategic understanding on the regional situation and a substantial defense cooperation agreement covering all three service arms. <coughs> we also have a shared perspective on security and terrorism-related issues. Let me now turn very briefly to some multilateral and global issues. Our membership of the UN Security Council, which Professor Chaudhary had mentioned, has been in the context of rapid developments in many parts of the Middle East and North Africa. Global food prices and energy costs have been at record levels, and the economic and financial crisis in the developed countries has shown no signs of abating. The impact of all these factors has been much more severe on developing countries in their quest for a better life for their people. At the same time, there is a general lack of forward movement on critical, critical global negotiations on trade or on climate change. Our priority in this UN Security Council, therefore, has been to strengthen multilateralism, the creation of equitable, rule-based global governance, and to focus on issues of concern to developing countries. Reform of older structures, and in particular, the UN Security Council, is therefore one of our key interests. Let me dwell very briefly on the climate change uh, aspect, because this is topical in the context of the Durban meeting taking place. The Stockholm Environment Institute recently published a report examining four recent detailed studies of mitigation pledges of various countries under the Cancun decision and compared the developed countries' pledges to developing countries' pledges. Its findings, in fact, conclusively establish that in absolute terms, pledges by the developing countries amount to much more than the developed countries' pledges. Consequently, at least till 2020, the lead in mitigation is being undertaken ironically by developed country, developing countries, including India. In our view, the only way to bring about a balance in the mitigation targets is for the developed countries to take on a second commitment period to the Kyoto Protocol unconditionally. In Durban, our approach therefore will give importance to the following three points. Firstly, equitable access to sustainable development. Secondly, to speak out against unilateral trade measures. And finally, accelerated access to critical mitigation and adaption technologies and related intellectual property rights. These points bear repetition because we hear of language and recommendations which, for instance, refers to categories of developing and developed as being outmoded 20th century thinking. Such a view will hardly facilitate a consensus. Neither will unilateral measures, such as the tax which have been imposed by the EU on civil aviation on account of uh, carbon emissions. Let me now try to wind up with some more general uh, remarks. Economic and technological changes are altering existing notions of geography and cartography. Let me illustrate by going back to the mid-90s when the Asia-Europe movement 
was launched. To many people then, and I can say this from personal experience, to many people then Asia meant noodles and chopsticks. Uh, for instance, India and indeed the whole of South Asia was not invited to be a member of the Asia-Europe uh, movement. I was then posted in London as political counselor and can vividly recall the difficulties of trying to explain to my government how the British Foreign Office could conceive of Asia without India being in it. Today, Southeast Asia and South Asia are viewed more compositely. Even the Indian Ocean region alone is seen as being too limiting or too limited a category. And there is a growing circulation of the term, quote, Indo-Pacific, unquote. In recent weeks, there has been a great deal of attention paid to what is called the US's new Asia-Pacific doctrine. On the economic side, there have similarly been assessments of the likely implications of the Trans-Pacific <coughs> Partnership on the financial and commercial architecture in this region. Finally, there have been recent comments from Australia regarding possible security and defense architectures. There is, of course, an enthusiastic commentary which has accompanied these ideas. Implicit in some of these comments is the belief or notion that somehow India is like clay that can be guided or molded. There is therefore some extent of expectation that such initiatives immediately imply a reordering of options as far as India is concerned. It is obvious, however, that all such initiatives and policies will be seen by India through the prism of its own interests as equally from the perspective of enhancing stability in the region. It may be prudent, therefore, to see these recent initiatives in the context of an already very deep and very old US military and economic presence in Asia and the Pacific. The announcements that have been announced of military presence are marginal when compared to existing force levels. What is important, however, is the emphasis on engagement and greater diplomatic engagement is certainly very important. One illustration is the ongoing visit of the US Secretary of State to Myanmar. Clearly, a greater diplomatic engagement by the US with a country with which we have had historical relationships is something we would welcome. A reduction in the isolation of Myanmar would clearly be in our interest from different points of view, ranging from the political to the economic and commercial. Let me now finally turn to the general reflections part of the topic of my talk. Although there has been little, little attention paid to this in Singapore, a significant part of the current discourse in India is devoted to reflecting on the 20 years which have passed since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, or indeed the 20 years that have elapsed since the creation of new states in Central Asia. It is now well established that the decline of the Soviet Union, the steps taken to liberalize the Indian economy, and the first steps also towards the Look East policy are intimately related. It is worth noting that it is worth noting that this inauguration of the Look East policy coincided also with India <coughs> recovering its lost sense of Central Asia. It is useful to recall this earlier dynamic as so much of the discourse on India's Look East policy is casually or causally related to the rise of China. It can reasonably be argued that through the 1950s and 60s also, India had been looking East. The East we saw then the East we saw then, however, was quite different from what we viewed in the 1990s. The point, therefore, I wish to reflect on is to evaluate our Look East policy in more metaphorical terms. It has been persuasively argued by many that in the past 20 years, the outward appearance of our foreign policy has changed a great deal and that it has acquired a new lexicon and a new vocabulary. For instance, a high moral ground or strong nationalist pride does not invariably form part of our official discourse. Our approach now is more pragmatic in tone. So if looking east is a metaphor, then in that sense, our foreign policy has turned east because in many ways, this pragmatic worldview prevails. We have a prioritization so that our own GDP growth is most important. These, in fact, are also the consequences of a stronger engagement with 
and in Southeast Asia. At the same time, our basic principles have not changed. If our concerns are not stridently stated at the highest possible decibel level, it does not mean that they have not registered. Our views, therefore, are no secret of the new technologies of force or at the growing militarization of international relations. This perspective has informed our view of recent developments in the Middle East, where we have seen conventional air power, covert and special forces, and internet social media, combined with older forms of propaganda, older forms of propaganda to change regimes and create political outcomes which serve the interests of a small combination of countries. Our disagreement with these views and approaches has of course led to a suggestion of disappointment or calls of those who call, or call upon us to be responsible. <coughs> In India such suggestions have been shrugged off because we have a very long tradition now to decipher what constitutes our national interests and the tactical and policy means we must adopt to secure it. While evaluating India's perspectives on different initiatives, it is unlikely, therefore, that an outsider will get a fully stated belt and shong or a fully stated, coherently argued statement of views. More useful, it is perhaps to evaluate India's approach on the basis of its stated principles. I would briefly summarize here, as part of our long stated principles, three negatives. And these three negatives are an avoidance of concerts of power, an avoidance of groups of group speak and an avoidance of exported solutions. It is this broad approach that informs how we view developments or initiatives affecting us or our neighborhood. External policies, to go back to elementary principles, are derived from an assessment by policymakers of capabilities and intentions. Capabilities and intentions of other powers on the horizon. Both sets are important and foreign policy judgment lies in recognizing and addressing the role of both and not be blown off course by too sharp a focus on one or an underplaying of the other. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, High Commissioner. Uh, it's true that uh, we deliberated uh, uh, for some days on, 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 on the exact uh, title of the topic, but uh, you have done uh, absolute, I must say, justice to the idea. I mean, that was the idea that you should come and speak to issues uh, that relate to India today and, uh, and that would generate the kind of discussions that I hope your remarks will. The floor, with those words, are now open. Uh, if you will identify yourself, it will help uh, Chair and others. Uh, or, uh, uh, yes. I'm Robin Jeffrey. I've worked in ISIS. Um, Hi, Commissioner. You finished with the three of the three no's. I guess they would say in Chinese parlance. Um, what are the three positives then with Indian foreign policy? I mean, the way you concluded would be the way some critics would regard Indian foreign policy that it is a collection of things India doesn't do. But what does India? Are you able to articulate, or do you feel able to articulate what Indian foreign policy stands for, what the principles are on which it's founded? You've said what it, it doesn't stand for. What, uh, what are the principles that it's founded on? Other than national self-interest, which of course would be the obvious quick reply. <laughs> well, I think national self-interest is an obvious uh, positive. Uh, and then the definition, uh, of course, is the next uh, but, I, but as I said, in our stated policies, and these do inform uh, actual implementation of uh, policy also, uh, would, be, uh, would be the intention to ensure that uh, the interests of developing countries are not subsumed by a louder or more well-articulated uh, perspective which emerges from other, from other quarters. The second, of course, would be to, uh, and this is again part of the national self-interest, but really to see that uh, uh, our immediate neighborhood and also our extended neighborhood does not, uh, does not uh, become uh, the arena of a situation which would in any way impact on our own national development. Uh, I think this view, although it has changed a great deal, but in fact informs Indian foreign policy from the 1950s onwards, that uh, 
that powers from outside or interests from outside not intrude into our uh, into our uh, what would be regarded as our uh, areas which have a vital bearing on our national development goals. I will put it in those terms. Does that satisfy you? We can continue the conversation. You can continue the conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mr. Sabir, sir. Uh, I have two questions, uh, Mr. High Commissioner, sir. Uh, exactly in a year's time, ASEAN leaders will be congregating in New Delhi for the Commemorative Summit. Now, what does India really concretely expect from the summit or even plan to deliver at the, uh, the summit? I mean, let alone the ceremonial glamour and all that stuff. Because I remember China, when they hosted a similar summit like this a couple of years back, uh, they pledged billions of dollars worth of funds for infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia. So probably somewhere along that line, what does India plan to deliver during that summit? Now my second question is, as we have seen, um, China has become quite assertive uh, regionally uh, when, it come, when it comes to the South China Sea or even Arunachal Pradesh for that matter. So what challenges will this post to India's Look East foreign policy beyond the year 2012. Thank you. I think there is a there is a very large calendar of events planned for planned for 2012. But if I were to summarize what uh, would be the thrust of uh, 2012, I would uh, I would say it would be to concentrate on connectivity. And the physical connectivity between uh, between ASEAN and India, or between ASEAN and South Asia, really is critical if uh, the the potential for economic and commercial cooperation has to be fully reaped. And therefore, concentrating on physical connectivity really means concentrating on Myanmar and uh, Thailand, particularly on the road network, on the rail networks. Air connectivity has shown dramatic uh, expansion in the past uh, few years. One fact which is not often realized is, for instance, between India and Singapore, you have something like 40 to 45 flights daily operating, which is an extraordinarily large number when you consider the situation perhaps five or ten years ago. So I would, I would imagine that uh, the main focus of 2012, from our point of view, would be on connectivity. What will India promise? Uh, I think we'll have to wait and see. But as I said, there's a whole calendar of events uh, planned. And, and our effort really, when we deal with ASEAN, is that we are dealing with a fairly wide spectrum of uh, countries. We have uh, the quality of our relationship with, uh, with uh, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, has elements in it which are not present in our relationship, for instance, with Singapore, the technical cooperation uh, program, uh, and such like. Uh, there is uh, some amount of uh, discussion in terms of uh, setting up centers which would address concerns of uh, uh, developing countries within ASEAN as also concerns uh, uh, of uh, uh, requirements of India in different uh, fields. And there is considerable scope for cooperation uh, with ASEAN in that regard. China, I think it is. Uh, the rise of China is a major, important, uh, critical factor of this uh, century. It's not just India, but all its entire proximate neighborhood which has to deal with it. Uh, it has often been said by our uh, leaders that uh, the rise of China offers great opportunities for India. It is true to say that I think that, uh, that, that the growth of the Chinese economy has been a major boon to the surrounding uh, to the surrounding region, to many countries in Southeast Asia. And indeed, our own economic uh, interaction with China has grown very, very uh, rapidly. There will also be elements of competition. It is inevitable. We have a long history with China. Both of us are civilizational <coughs> entities, but we have had a particular history in the past 50 years, which cannot also be overlooked. How to manage the relationship is a priority for the leadership of both countries. Also, what is said that the world is large enough to contain both yes. India and China. Professor Prasenjit there, right? Yeah, thanks. Uh, but this is I'm from NUS, and uh, this is a very small question and uh, an unusual question. 
from me as an Assamese. As to uh, be expected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, are, what is the possibilities? I mean, you know, till I would say five or ten years ago, it was inconceivable that the northeast of India could open up and link up with, uh, provide the basis of uh, relationships with Southeast Asia. So mm -hmm. have, have the situation changed, uh, uh, both internally and externally, uh, to make this more feasible? Thinking about the roadways and so on that yeah. you mentioned. I think in terms of connectivity <coughs> between India and Myanmar, there has been a great deal of work on the ground. Has it been enough? Perhaps not, because there is an internal situation in both Myanmar as also in India, which has to be taken into taken into account. But certainly, I think on the multimodal transport link, on the road links, a great deal of investment and a great deal of work has been uh, done. Possibly, it will receive even greater emphasis in the coming uh, in the coming years. And certainly, such signs of such an emphasis are very very evident uh, today. So, I would be very very optimistic. On you, were you also referring to the to the transit, I mean, the connectivity between Northeast and the rest of India through Bangladesh? Being born in Assam myself, I... That, that, that would be very interesting, too, because there is a road plan, isn't it, cutting through? Uh, that is true. I mean, the whole question of transit is, is yeah. that, I mean, linking Northeast uh, uh, so that, with uh, that. So that is... Uh, it is my question. question. It's yours. <laughs> Yeah, the transit. I think the transit part is, yes, between India and Bangladesh, very important. And really, it's nothing, in a sense, there's nothing new to it. It's really going back to a state of affairs which existed uh, uh, in the past. But the devil, of course, lies in uh, many details. Uh, I, I referred to in my statement about uh, a, new, uh, a new convergence opening up between India and uh, Bangladesh. <coughs> And I think it is in that general force which one uh, should, uh, that one should give the greatest emphasis to. Uh, my own sense is that, uh, <coughs> that given the lineup of the objective forces which I mentioned, which is the, which is the power of trade, the, 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 the forces which are generated by travel, and the capacity for individuals to communicate with each other, Directly. Many of these issues will in fact fade away far more rapidly than one would have anticipated 10 or 15 years uh, ago. There is a synergy developing between India and uh, Bangladesh. And in fact, uh, if one looks at the extreme case of India and uh, Pakistan, similarly, many things which did not appear at all possible uh, 10 years ago have happened and uh, in fact are uh, leading on to having all kinds of uh, uh, new, new. Uh, new frameworks. Uh, uh, if you see India-Pakistan uh, in 2002 or 2003, to think of cross-LOC trade would have been, uh, it would not have been something which would have been uh, considered as happening, as being likely in the next five years. Now we have more positive statements about most favored nation uh, treatment uh, than have been there in the last uh, 30 years. So I would say that one should look at the general uh, framework, and in the general framework, uh, trade, travel, and people communicating with each other directly have a very powerful influence on uh, eroding uh, the, the, the power of these older problems uh, such as they are. I think to put it in very simple terms, uh, Travel and people communicating with each other has made it impossible for states to demonize uh, one another. And this is the big change which has happened in India and uh, Pakistan, that in many cases civil society is far ahead of uh, uh, the governments of both uh, countries. And possibly the same thing is also happening in the case of Bangladesh, uh, except that it doesn't get so much attention. Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd endorse that. I mean, in my previous avatar, uh, you see, uh, where we thought our government represented civil society values. The point that we made then uh, is that uh, it, it was in, in mutual interest to move towards the loosening. I mean, it should not be, we knew that it is possible that the Awami may come in the, in the future, but we would, did not want it to be seen as single party led. It was broadly, we thought, representative 
of the new values of, of a new uh, 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 generation in many ways who sort of uh, are, are, are bred to newer issues, etc., uh, which would look beyond the region, look to regional connectivity. As a matter of fact, the SAAD uh, in which uh, uh, connectivity was the broad theme was uh, during our time. I mean, you see, this time it was building bridges, I think. Uh, but we began, in fact, politically accepted connectivity, which was then, by the way, a very sensitive issue as a major SAAD theme. Yes? Uh, uh, I'm Professor Nateshan from IIT Bombay. Um, key question for you, and this is primarily because uh, the emergence of India, as you can, has uh, attracted a lot of attention from the press, global press. But there's also been, in the last few years, much more prominent statements being coming, coming from some quarters that India is a reluctant world power. That India is not willing to step up to the plate to take its justified position as a global power. What's your view on I think th these are, you know, uh, these terms have been used and uh, I recall once Mrs. Gandhi in one of her speeches had referred to India as being a different kind of power. Uh, in another context it has been stated that India is a major power with many poor people uh, uh, in it. Uh, I think one has to take a composite uh, view uh, of such uh, categorizations. As I said, uh, we evaluate or we try to evaluate what is happening in terms of our own interests as we perceive, uh, as we perceive them. Uh, and eval such an evaluation may lead to a course of action which others feel is not adequate or it's not, uh, it's, uh, or it's not sufficient. But in our assessment, that is the, that is the best course of action uh, dictated, taking into account various uh, factors. Certainly, there will be many who will be disappointed that you are not doing enough on X, Y, Z. But while our assessment may be that we are doing enough, or we don't need to do too much uh, over there uh, right now. So at a general level, I think this kind of issue will continue. Uh, if I extend this uh, uh, further, and here I'm thinking aloud a bit with your indulgence, uh, I think our, our, we have a very powerful highly articulate uh, section within our middle class uh, which really wants to uh, uh, which wants to outperform the rest of the country so a lot of such discourse emanates from within uh, within india too and uh, while it is important that we set high targets it's also realistic to bind oneself to what is possible within our own uh, bandwidth uh, there is also that is the indian version of dang's famous dictum uh, hide your capabilities and bide your time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. If I may just follow up for one second on that. Uh, 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 okay. yes, a quick follow up because uh, okay. we're already giving the floor. Sorry. Uh, just a quick follow up. But there seems to be at least a general perception, and maybe that's within India as well, that we, India is not willing to be as vocal, as strident, as perhaps a newly emergent China which in the last 10 years have become increasingly vocal and increasingly strident on the international stage. And there's that perception within the country that perhaps our foreign policy frameworks and formulators are not keeping up with regard to what the expectations of the people. I think stridency makes very good media copy, but it doesn't achieve what you want. So, and I don't uh, also necessarily agree that Chinese policy is always strident. Chinese policy is strident on issues which they think are of importance or of relevance, uh, uh, relevance to them. But necessarily being articulate on every issue or, or on every issue on which others are being articulate is not necessarily a, it's not a qualification. You sir, then Ambassador C. Jackman. Thank you very much, Um Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your enlightenment. Now the question is that corresponding with my learned <coughs> question and in response to your uh, version too, the question of consistency in terms of the Indian policy. It sometimes it just lacks, and then the question, for example, the Security Commission proposition, it just lacks here and there. So beside the business as usual, what would you expect in the circumstances of business unusual that you know India 
would give rise to certain proposition, likewise the surprise visit, the American policy toward Myanmar, for example, suddenly you find a quick transformation. So what do you expect that India, year 212, that you can see a, a kind of, a, you know, revisitation into re, uh, redevising what exactly India seemed to be missing in the past, that India would like to initiate something which is, I think, in the new direction of what going on with America moving into Myanmar that is part of within the South Asia configuration. So what do you have in mind in the business as unusual kind of situation that you know that you you expect India will, will activate for? I think on Myanmar our policy is very consistent. So in fact it's so consistent that it doesn't need some breaks uh, or dramatic Gestures. And in fact, if one, uh, uh, this is a bit heretical, but uh, uh, if you see our policy towards uh, some of the other uh, current issues in Southeast Asia, if you take the case of uh, uh, Cambodia, for instance, uh, in the last 50 years, our policy has been much more consistent than of most other countries in the region. My question relates to ASEAN. It has always been all often said that Delhi is very supportive of ASEAN playing a central role in the regional architecture, so-called ASEAN centrality. My question is, in, in what way ASEAN centrality will serve India's strategic interest in our region? Can you elaborate on that? Well, it's a broad question, but I'll give one or two instances. I think it's often not taken into account that the first defense uh, uh, defense grouping that we have become part of has been the ATMM plus uh, mechanism. Uh, we have never been part of a defense grouping of this kind. Uh, uh, if you look through the last uh, 50 years, we were out of every other concert, every other pact. So clearly there is something in the ASEAN uh, mechanism or in the ans ASEAN instrument which we find uh, that we can, uh, we can work with and which is in our, uh, and which is in our uh, interest. And this really is on the most uh, sensitive part of foreign policy which is defense uh, uh, relations. Uh, in that sense if one sees the last 15 years and uh, the kind of intensity there has been to India-ASEAN uh, interaction, it's quite dramatic as compared to anything else happening uh, elsewhere in the, in the world, where our alliances or our uh, movements have been more tactical in, uh, in nature. But uh, uh, the other example is in terms of the rapidity with which we have uh, reached uh, free trade agreements within uh, ASEAN in a relatively short period of time from 2007 onwards. The entire uh, landscape of uh, economic uh, integration in between uh, India and Southeast Asia has been uh, changed. And certainly this is much faster than anywhere else uh, uh, in the world. So again, clearly there is something which we find that we can work with. And perhaps it is for that reason that we give so much importance to the centrality of uh, ASEAN as an instrument for dealing with Southeast Asia. Uh. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, just uh, following up, Singapore Singh, uh, I says, just following up on what you're saying earlier, obviously there are a lot, of, <coughs> a lot of vision about how East Asia should be structured. We have the Australian APC uh, idea, which uh, Indian response was slightly muted. Which I found interesting, you say India doesn't want to be involved in a concert of powers. The APC idea was basically a, a concert of powers. Then you got the ASEAN model. Uh, ASEAN Central is Then you have the US kind of vision about East Asian regional, which is about certain institutions do certain things. Like EAS should be about security, APEC should be about economics. Where, what is the Indian vision uh, version for East Asian region? Where do you sit in this constellation of different regions? The Australian, the Chinese, the ASEAN, where do you fit? I think A, it's, uh, <coughs> it's uh, not necessary for us to try to define ourselves vis-a-vis -vis each of these visions because 
we, uh, we sit where we are. We don't have to try to explain uh, what it is and what it is not. Uh, I think on, on the recent, uh, recent uh, suggestions of uh, Australia, our response was not muted. What we said was we don't know about this, and in fact we didn't know about it. But as a general principle, that we will avoid concerts, that we will not be in uh, defense uh, uh, relationships which appear to give the impression of leading to more rivalries in our region, I think those principles will remain and uh, uh, are not going to change. On the larger question of uh, where we stand with respect to the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership or APEC, we are not a member of APEC. I think right now our priorities are to get a good uh, free trade agreement covering uh, good services and investments uh, with, uh, with ASEAN and then from, move from that to the next uh, stage which is an agreement with the ASEAN plus uh, six. So I think we will see uh, our interests in that sequence rather than, try to, rather than be blown off course by other suggestions which keep in mind. Well, uh, uh, yeah, we have Professor John Harris, Harris okay. will be to go a few seconds, I think. Okay, uh, okay, okay. He, he yields four. Welcome to Singapore. Um, okay, I have one question to ask. Um, there's flood recently in Thailand. Um, and, um, yeah, you have actually mentioned about global warming. And just now my friend actually mentioned about what is the takeaway for the Southeast Asia Summit. And I believe that India's strength is on technology. And um, with that technology from the shortage of fossil fuels, uh, I believe that India is actually developing on the wind power, um, energy, cleaner energy. Is there a way that um, the connectivity that we are talking about could add in with the word called social? It's people to people, getting everyone connected, and so that uh, India is trying to actually speak up for the world. You see, we have a critical shortage of energy in our country. Uh, that shortage implies that we have to use all possible uh, means uh, to increase uh, uh, the availability of energy. So that would be wind power, nuclear power, solar. Uh, but the fact is that uh, we have very large coal reserves. Uh, we have 500 million uh, people in India, uh, or 400 million people who may not have power. Uh, and the most effective way of using, of providing power to them would be to use the coal reserves. Those coal reserves will have to be supplemented by imports of coal because the quality of the coal in India may not be enough. But really, in a realistic time frame, to see uh, <coughs> options other than thermal power making up for the energy deficit in India would not be realistic. Uh, this does place a certain uh, uh, gives a certain emphasis on our approach to the climate change uh, negotiations. Because uh, in brief, our view is that you cannot compare uh, uh, apples and oranges. If there are 400 million people without power, you can't expect them to do without when there are people who have, uh, whose, let's say, carbon emissions uh, are, much, uh, are much higher. So I think wind power or solar power will be important, but in the end it will not play a overriding uh, or very major role in making up the energy deficit unless there are major technological breakthroughs, especially in solar power. Thank you. Professor Harris. If it's permitted, uh, could we just look west very briefly? Uh, we're going to a site of sort of some volatility in India's, you know, uh, fairly close, close neighborhood. I wonder if you could just, uh, purely for information, uh, really just, uh, tell us a little bit about India's position in regards to I Iran, I mean, especially in a context where, uh, as, as, as we know, uh, the UK and then the European uh, community uh, is stepping up sanctions uh, against Iran. But looking west, also, uh, prompts me to, to think back to the question that the gentleman over there asked about India as a reluctant world power. I mean, we recently saw one of India's partners in IMSA, Brazil, um, actually intervening in a, I thought, rather interesting way in concert with, uh, with Turkey in, in the affairs of the Middle East. I mean, is it possible to think um, 
in the future of India taking that sort of initiative in, uh, in, 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 other, in other parts of the, uh, of the world. With regard to Iran, it's, uh, we have uh, what we term as civilization and links with uh, Iran. It's a very old civilization. We've had uh, 2,000 years of uh, shared, uh, shared history uh, with it. Uh, at the present day, 50% of our hydrocarbon imports are from Iran. 50% uh, of our hydrocarbon requirements are met from by Iranian uh, crude oil. Our refineries uh, import Iranian uh, crude, we define it and uh, use it. So we have, <coughs> I would say, if you include uh, fossil fuels, maybe a 10 or $12 billion trade turnover with, uh, with Iran. There have also been efforts to build a pipeline, because Iran is very, it's, it's the second largest source of uh, gas, a pipeline from Iran uh, to, uh, to India. Uh, at the same time, we are cognizant that Iran is a, party to the nuclear non-proliferation agreement and it must honor the commitments it has uh, taken on in that uh, agreement. So we have voted against uh, Iran uh, in the International Atomic Energy Authority with regards to its uh, possible weaponization of its nuclear program. In brief, we have, a, we have to manage these two different poles. That on the one hand, tell Iran that it has to be mindful of its international obligations, those which it has taken on uh, willingly, and be at the same time a very important bilateral uh, relationship. We don't necessarily see Iran in the same terms as the West uh, uh, does. We think that a more diplomatic uh, focused uh, engagement with Iran would possibly yield uh, better results. But that is not a view which is uh, shared, and in fact the difference in perception is so wide that the scope for initiative is, uh, is, uh, is limited. Uh, well, we, uh, Iran is important for uh, in Afghanistan also because it is a major factor for stability, but it is land access after sea access. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, in our view, Iran can play a very helpful role in uh, Afghanistan. It was a critical factor uh, at the beginning of the present stage of, uh, of uh, Iran, Afghanistan's evolution in the bond process when it was uh, a stabilizing uh, factor. Since then, its own bilateral relations with the other Western powers have uh, uh, degenerated very considerably. So, so that role is no longer Given the very pragmatic and uh, commercial foreign policy that we have not seen for some time, have we actually dropped the Nagaland story altogether or are we still seeing it? For a long time we were one of the main proponents of the Nagaland movement. Have we just dropped it now? It's all faded away? Or is it somewhere in the back? No, the Nagaland meetings continue to take place. They take place on the margins of all international conferences, we attend all the meetings. Uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, whether you use that term or not, our policy is very much non-aligned, which is why you hear uh, hear so much about why isn't India doing X, Y, Z, because uh, we feel that to do X, Y, or Z at different points of time may not be in our uh, own uh, interest. And in that sense, non-alignment has, has meant that you don't go with one or the other major power prevailing at the time but try to follow your own interests. Yeah, yeah. also the essence of non-alignment is uh, not uh, taking an a priori position on an issue, a priori position coming from, from, from uh, uh, before. In other words, judging every event or issue as you have just described Iran on the merits of its own case. That essence of non-alignment is still there. I mean, uh, India does not say that it has moved away from, from that non-alignment. In other words, not to take a predetermined position on any given issue. Yeah, like on the Libyan issue, India was in a minority which opposed the UN resolution. But I think but you, that explained that, and you also explained that in your saying that it does, when it does not serve a small group of nations. As if I thought you were talking about Libya then. Yeah, yeah <coughs> Libya is not. Yes. It's yeah. There are people on that side. Yes. That yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
My question is in relation to one of the objectives of India's foreign policy. If I understood you correctly, you said uh, one of the objectives was to ensure that any involvement, any external involvement in the region is not deemed in India's economy or otherwise. How do you then explain, given that, China's involvement in Sri Lanka? What is India's approach to that? Well, I think uh, it is inevitable that as China grows as an economy, its involvement in the entire Asian region will increase. To see that as being something necessarily adverse uh, to India is not so. Uh, as uh, I think Professor Chaudhary had said, that uh, India and China are not a zero sum. Uh, it's not a zero-sum game, but if A, China has a presence in place X that is necessarily against uh, India's interest, there may be a commercial opportunity which has been exploited by Chinese uh, uh, companies. Having said that, as I mentioned in my conclusion, I think uh, all foreign policy is based on trying to evaluate capabilities and intentions. And uh, uh, that uh, there is a mix uh, of uh, judging capability and judging intention. Uh, yeah, and that certainly is being carried out by us uh, too. So if there is a Chinese <coughs> presence very close to our borders, which we feel gives a capability which would not be in our interest, then we would be the, we would be responding to it appropriately. So hence, China's involvement in Sri Lanka is something that is of interest, in a sense of a positive interest to India, and therefore, there yeah, is. You see, China is our largest trading partner. Uh, we can hardly say that if it has trade or economic relation with other countries, <coughs> that is against our interest. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. I commissioned that this is more to do with uh, economics of trade and investment. One of the unique things that the Singapore government has done is to have mutual uh, trade and investment, more of investment protection agreements starting with neighboring countries, and it has ex expanded to well over 100 countries. As you know, I deal more with Africa. Would India also consider doing this bilateral mutual investment agreement with the, mainly with the African countries, uh, as learning from the Singapore model? I think we have uh, bilateral investment protection agreements with many countries. I'm not sure of the exact number, but I know many of them are also in Africa where a number of Indian investments already uh, already exist. But if you have any specific countries in mind, I could check and let you know. Uh, I'm not sure about the details, but I know we have uh, bilateral investment protection agreements with many countries. Mamta. Hi, Mamta from ICAS. In the context of looking east, uh, what are Bilateral relations between India and Japan, especially following the recently effective CIPA agreement that took effect in August. Or what sort of potential do you see in the in the future of the relations between these two countries? Thank you. I believe we have very good uh, relations with uh, Japan, and certainly in the past few years there have been developments which suggest that uh, there is a great deal of Japanese interest. Uh, in, uh, in India in terms of uh, as, uh, as a destination of Japanese uh, investments. <coughs> there is a perception in Japan that uh, uh, it needs to move its manufacturing to other, to other places. Uh, uh, one of the destinations they are looking at is, uh, is India. And uh, on our part, uh, I think we are trying to encourage this movement of uh, Japanese investments away from North Asia to South Asia, and in particular to India. And, uh, there, in particular, there's a great deal of talk about the uh, Mumbai-Delhi industrial and freight uh, corridor, which are being developed with, uh, with Japanese assistance. Yes. If I, Your Excellency, if I may ask the most, probably what may be the most thorny question. Okay. We all know that uh, Sino-Indian relations have been growing, uh, so much so that every time I've mentioned the famous phrase of Nero of Hindi, Chini, Bai Bai, I've always been corrected to say Bai Bai as in Bai Bai. So with these two, um, this movement of increased trade between India and China, how do, will that affect uh, India's position as the home to the uh, Tibetan government in exile? 
because India has been the home of His Holiness and Dharamsala for, I think, since the 1950s. It's been a thorny issue. Will increased relations between India and China affect that? So the Dalai Lama is a respected spiritual uh, leader. And he's in India as our uh, uh, guest. And he has been there for many years. I don't see relations, growing relations between India and uh, China as affecting the Dalai Lama's uh, position in India or affecting the position of the many Tibetans who, who, who live in India. Of course, the, the condition which is put is that there should be no political activity. And this is what we also tell the, the government of China that. Uh, the Dalai Lama is a spiritual leader uh, uh, who lives in India, but that does not mean that he has the uh, that that he will be carrying out activity aimed against China from uh, from uh, from India. Now it is a it is a somewhat uh, complex issue, and there are as there have been in the past few days, uh, there will always be uh, points when uh, the two governments will not see eye to eye. Uh, on uh, on how this uh, particular relationship is being uh, uh, is being managed, but I think there are mechanisms in place to make sure that the that the differences such as they emerge are managed and kept within uh, reasonable uh, limits. Okay, all good things must end, and uh, it's, uh, and, and this this thing is ending well. And I want to thank you. Uh, the full house shows the kind of interest uh, that uh, the subject generated and you did not disappoint the house so i want to congratulate you on this uh, i shan't uh, 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 attempt to summarize uh, 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 the very rich discussions that we had today but if there is any takeaway from this it is that uh, uh, as with india as with all major major entities global entities there are constants and variables in foreign policy uh, and uh, uh, both change. In fact, uh, even the constants and variables change at different speeds. Uh, even though the constants remain, India's values uh, perhaps remain more constant than others. And the way India interprets or reinterprets uh, uh, the emerging world around it and really relates to the world is where they are discernible or sometimes not even discernible changes uh, in India's external behavior pattern. I'm going to invite all of you to a tea reception uh, hereafter, but not before I uh, g uh, uh, give you a small token of our appreciation to remember us by and read in your spare time. <laughs> Could I invite all of you uh, uh, to our next event, which will be on the 30th of January, the Ambassador of France will be here to talk about uh, non-proliferation and uh, how uh, that impacts on the on South Asian So,